in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the RCA video disc system. It's also known as a capacitance electronic disc or CED for short. Amongst other things, we're going to be having a look at how I managed to repair a couple of machines that I bought off eBay for next to nothing. We'll have a look at the titles that are available, take a close look at the technology itself and check out the quality and then of course ultimately decide whether or not a video disc player earns a place under my television. The video disc is a technology that RCA were working on from the 1960s. In fact, it's been reported that the development of the product cost them $600 million. But when it finally did come to the market in 1981, the market wasn't interested. It had already moved on to other things. RCA pretty much bet the farm on video disc and lost the lot. Now, if you haven't seen a video disc before, you'll be forgiven for thinking that this is not a disc, but this is just the plastic protective caddy. The disc itself is held inside. But the idea of storing video on a disc was nothing new. In fact, it goes all the way back to 1927 and the dawn of television and the Baird Phonovision that stored some early test video recordings on a disc. But of course, that was just experimental stuff. There was another product that came out before the RCA video disc though. It came out in Europe in 1975 and it's known as the TED. Now these are relatively unheard of nowadays or people have generally forgotten about them and it wasn't really a big hit at the time for a few reasons. Uh, it holds video on a flexi disc and it's an eight inch flexi disc and again it's held inside a paper protective caddy so you don't get your fingerprints and dust on it and things. Uh, the machine itself, unfortunately I don't have one so I can't show this to you, uh, you put the disc in the machine, it'd fold it over a roller, put it in and then spin it at 1500 revolutions per minute and hold it on a cushion of air. But it only held 10 minutes of video and I'd imagine it was probably quite expensive as well at the time so as you can imagine, that's probably why it's largely forgotten about nowadays. When you compare that to the RCA video disc system that came out only six years later, quite a bit more sophisticated. A US disc could hold 60 minutes per side and a UK one 75 minutes per side. And the reason for the difference the UK disc spun at a slower rate of 375 RPM versus the US 450 and that's because of the difference between the UK's 50 Hz signal and the US's 60 Hz. Now the disc itself inside it'll look to you pretty much like a vinyl record and that's probably because it pretty much is in, in a way uh, it's a PVC mixed with carbon and it needs that because it needs to be conductive you see unlike a normal record where you've got a stylus that uh, goes around a spiral and as the stylus hits the edges of the trench that's cut into the record that creates vibrations which create sound a video disc works quite a bit differently the spiral still on there for a diamond stylus to track from the outside to the inside but that uh, trench doesn't have any uh, variation in it it's just smooth all the way around what it is it's the height inside there's a peaks and troughs but not like a digital one that goes up and down it varies up and down so in, in effect the capacitance is measured as a di difference in the electrical voltage as the um, trough goes up and down the voltage adjusts and that's what creates the video signal but I think it's a lot easier than trying to demonstrate it to this where you can't even see uh, the um, spiral because it's so fine uh, to actually show you some video that's been done by a, a very helpful chap that's let me show it to you now this incredible footage comes courtesy of Ben at the Applied Science channel and in the video description you'll find a link to his channel and this particular video. But what you're looking at here is an electron microscope's view of how a record is played. That at the top is the stylus that's resting inside the groove on the piece of vinyl and as it vibrates around that's what creates the sound. Now bear in mind that this image is the same stylus however it's resting on top of a video disc, a CED. And notice you can't see the trench in this one until you get really really close and you can see how closer and finer the spacing is of the track that goes around the CED. It's only really after looking at the surface of one of these under an electron microscope that you get a proper appreciation for the technological achievement that went into packing so much data so close together on a piece of PVC. 
But after hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, the product finally made its way to the US market in 1981, and it followed to the UK in 1983. And whilst initial sales were good, they fell off sharply. And in the UK even, they withdrew from the market after only six months on sale. And you can imagine there'd be a lot of unsold stock sold off very cheaply. Now in the US, they carried on for a little bit longer. The machines carried on being manufactured up until 1984. And the discs, new releases, kept coming out on the format until 1986. Now let's take a closer look at a CED, but let me just point out to those people that are panicking that I'm destroying history by taking these out of their cases. Don't worry, these discs are already knackered. Trust me, I've had a good look at them, tested them out, they're unplayable, irreparable X-discs, so do not panic. Anyway, notice here at the top, we've got side one, and on the other side, obviously side two. It's mentioned on there because you could actually put the insides of these back into that caddy the wrong way up, and of course that would explain what was going on. Now, the caddies normally get unlocked when you put them in the machine. It's got little clips either side here. The early one, I'd snap those off so I could get it open easily. Again, do not panic about that. That disc was also knackered. So the bit on the right gets left in the machine. This caddy is left outside. Notice it's just plastic inside. However, it's got a bit of sort of felt type stuff on the edge there to stop the disc getting scratched as it gets removed. Now, you may have noticed that earlier on, the disc that I was holding was covered in greasy fingerprints, and that wasn't my fault. I hadn't just been eating a bag of cheesy puffs. No, the disc itself is covered in grease. It's covered in a silicon lubricant, which is there to reduce wear on the stylus. Now, a stylus will last for a thousand hours, and a disc itself will last for 500 plays, which to me sounds plenty. When's the last time you wanted to watch the same film 500 times? Now, just like a vinyl record, a dusty or dirty CED will skip, but unlike a vinyl record, there's no way to clean it. Of course, it's covered in a silicon lubricant, but as well as that, the grooves are so close together, you've got no chance. If you've got a dirty CED, you've pretty much got a dead CED. Now, this is something that amused me. On the centre of them, you'll see printed a copyright notice. That's a bit unusual because it's on a part of the disc that you're never supposed to look at. Of course, you're not supposed to remove them from that protective caddy. You might be wondering, how does the CED compare to the Laserdisc? Well, they're both the same size, but that's pretty much the only similarity. The Laserdisc actually made it to market a couple of years before the CED, and it pretty much trounces it in every department. Of course, it's read by a laser, which means that there's no stylus to wear out. You can touch the disc itself without damaging it. The video quality was approximately twice as good as the CED. I suppose the only thing in the CED's favour at the time was the fact that it would have been a lot cheaper to buy than a Laserdisc. Now, I made a video all about Laserdisc in 2015, and I anticipated there'd be quite a few people wanting to know whether or not I planned to make a similar video about CED. So I put a comment under there saying, I didn't plan on making a video about CED because I wasn't particularly interested in the format. After all, it's just got VHS quality. But that didn't stop a lot of people getting in touch and saying, hey, have you heard about this thing called CED? Uh, do you plan on making a video about it? But as well as the quality, there were another couple of things put me off the format. The first one is the cost of the machines on eBay is still very expensive, despite the fact that they're over 30 years old. And then you look at the titles. The US had 1,700 releases on CED up to 1986. So they get things like Blade Runner, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Alien, Ghostbusters, The Terminator, the Star Wars trilogy, Back to the Future, and 15 Bond movies all the way up to A View to a Kill. The UK only got what pretty much came out in those six months the machines were on sale. So they've got 272 titles, most of which are filler. You've got Goldfinger, that's your one Bond movie. You've got a few 70s movies, heck of a lot of concert music videos, and quite a lot of old black and white classics that could probably already have been seen on BBC Two on a Sunday afternoon. And then finally, to add insult to injury, the only players that were sold in the UK were all variants of this Hitachi model, which is a pretty basic machine and a generation behind the models that were finally sold in the US. They might have started off with manual loading mono machines, but they ended up with automatic loading stereo ones with additional navigation controls. The UK models were pretty basic in comparison, and there's no way I'm going to pay top whack for a rubbish machine. So I had an idea. Instead of 
buying an expensive model, why don't I get one that doesn't work? And then at least I'll have a bit of fun trying to get it working. And I might also save myself quite a bit of money as well. And that's exactly what I did. And what you're looking at here is a player that I got for, I think this was about £60, but it included 40 odd discs with it as well. So not too bad a deal. Now, if you're wondering about the different colour of the caddies, well, the blue ones, they're stereo releases. The ones that are white or supposed to be white, they're the mono titles. Let's just have a quick flick through these. Now you'll see these same titles turning up time and time again on eBay in the UK whenever anyone sells off their CED collection. And it's not because these are massively popular films and music titles. No, it's because when RCA pulled out of the UK market, all the unsold stock was sold off with a big bundle of discs and everyone got the same player and the same disc. You can imagine the advert would show all the decent titles on the top and it would say, get the latest technology and 30 top titles. All yours for just £199. Now the machine that I bought was sold as having problems loading a disc. There was something wrong with that mechanism. And sure enough, if you push a disc into the front of it, it's pretty tricky getting it in there. It seems to jam on something. It does turn on the light though, and then drop down inside the machine, albeit with a bit of a nasty sound. So there's definitely something wrong with that mechanism. So to get to it, you have to lift up the circuit board on the top. And then you can see the disc inside there on the platter in the middle. So we can just lift that off there. And then that's the blue part of the caddy that's been left inside. So we'll have to move that as well. Now, the way that these things work, when you put them in, there's like a square black plastic tray that you can see there, which lowers the disc down onto the center spindle. So we'll lift that up there. Now, the way it moves up and down is with this little belt here on this motor, it goes around that worm gear there, which turns around those teeth on the edge of this wheel, which lifts up this plastic arm that's hinged in the middle, and that pushes up on that black plastic tray. Now, at the back of the tray, on the right-hand side, you can see a little switch there. That tells it whether it's on side A or B. Behind there, we've got a lever, which pushes another micro switch, which is what turns on the motor for the turntable. That little white peg there is one of the two pegs that push inside the caddy to unlock the internal mechanism. And the fault that I needed to repair, you can see there a little bit of glue on that little plastic peg that had snapped off. Now, whilst we've got this open, it would be a shame not to have a look around the rest of it. You can see it's designed to be made as cheap as possible, really. We've got a basic system here with an arm that moves along a bar at the back. The motor's at the back. It's got a belt on it. In the middle of the arm, we've got the stylus. And the front of the arm's got a LED there to tell us where it's got up to on the disc. But on the bottom of it, it's just held up with a little plastic roller wheel, which moves along this little plastic beam here. If we lift the arm up underneath, you can see the stylus there on the end of that orange stick towards the back. It's a little uh, diamond stylus. You might just be able to make it out there. Now, the arm itself, when it comes back to its home position, rests on that little velvet pad there, which presumably cleans it as well as protecting it. Now, we'll have a look at the circuits in here, but I'm no kind of circuit expert, so this is really for people that are. But you can see it's nicely laid out, uh, very well labelled as well. If you were into your electronics, you better figure out pretty quickly, I'd imagine, what exactly all these things do. Uh, you can see there's a chip there from Toshiba, and then on the other side, we've got an NEC chip, one from Texas Instruments as well, and of course, Hitachi there. So lots of different off-the-shelf stuff inside here. Anyway, back to the matter in hand. I was now hoping that I got the machine working. I'd glued that black plastic peg back onto the loading tray. The loading mechanism seemed to work fine now. However, the disc still wouldn't turn. So I removed the motor out of the middle, thinking that maybe there's a belt fallen off it. And I had a look underneath that, and it turns out that it's a direct drive motor, so there's no belt to fall off. So a little bit more experimenting later, I figured out that if you hold down the motor that operates the eject mechanism, the other motor would start turning. And the reason for that is when the disc gets loaded into the machine and reaches its lowest point, that's supposed to transmit a bit of resistance back over that belt, which then goes through to the motor. And the load on the motor is then what triggers the other motor to play. But the belt was loose, which obviously means that's not going to work. So I replaced that belt. In fact, I bought two belts because there was another belt needed on the back of the machine. The part that moves the arm across also uses another belt. So I replaced that one as well because that one was also a little bit loose. So might as well do it at the same time. Still a problem though, the arms were crashing when they reached the middle or the outside. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. 
and then I realise that's my fault for having it open. There's a black bar on top of the arm which locates into this part of the circuit to tell it when the arm is in its home position. Of course, with the circuit out of the way, it can't do that. So once you've got that in place, you can then put a disc in the machine and now finally, hopefully I can watch my first CED. So the arm moved across and the disc spun and on the screen came a horrible green apparition of Ashford and Simpson. I thought there must be something wrong with the TV. Plugged it into a different television and had the same results. There's just this green tint to the video. We're missing some of the colours. Something's gone wrong, obviously, as you can see. So I twiddled every pot I could find on that circuit board without any kind of improvement. Still couldn't get the colours working. I've got a feeling this poor old machine had had a hard life. I think it's probably been kept in a shed for 30 years. So I think it's beyond repair. So what I decided to do was buy another machine. So enter machine number two. Now this one I got for £20 and the guy that was selling it advertised it as in need of repair and the reason was he said there was something in the way of the door wouldn't let you load a disc into it and he was right there is something there that blocks it. Now it's supposed to do that. The idea is of course once you've got a disc in the machine it stops you putting another one in on top and that's when the tray is in its low position inside. So I thought all I need to do plug it in get the tray to move up and Bob's your uncle. Uh, but it wasn't as simple as that. I did plug the machine in and it didn't seem to operate at all. There was no power going through to it whatsoever, which was a bit of a shame because I thought, oh, this might be a little bit more problematic than I thought. And then I had a look in the plug. Let's see if you can see what's wrong here. Yeah, the blue wire, the neutral, just isn't connected at all to its terminal there. So then I thought, well, this might be the simplest repair job in the world. All I need to do is screw that back in there, plug it in and we sorted. So I did that and yes, sure enough, power came through to the machine. So all I needed to do then was replace the belts. Now the first machine I replaced the belts on, I'd accidentally snapped off the pegs when I put the thing back in. I didn't show you that before, but the plastic was very brittle. So I had to sort of stick it back in with some Sugru. So I didn't want that to happen again. So on this machine, I used the Mrs. Hairdryer to warm up the plastic this time, get it nice and supple so I could unclip that without snapping anything. And then, of course, I swapped out the belt on the front because, again, that was loose on this machine, just like the previous one. And, of course, I also had to swap out the same belt on the back of the machine, again, for another cost of £1.08. Well, actually, it wasn't because I just swapped out the first machine before I chucked it in the bin. But, yeah, so I put the belt on the back one. Now, the back one, as you can see here, is perished on this machine. So it seems to be a thing with all these machines. You just need to replace these two belts. But I say at a cost of £1.08p for two belts, not a big deal. Seems to work fine now as well. However, inevitably, there was something else wrong. The arm was making a weird crashing sound. I thought, I'll have a look at the stylus, see what's going on. Took this screw out of the stylus door, which wasn't in the other model. I thought, what's that doing holding that down? And then I had a look inside here, and there's no stylus. There was a bit of black plastic there instead. And I thought, ah, I know what's going on here. This isn't an old model at all. This is a new machine that's never been used. The piece of plastic replaces a stylus in transit. The screw holds the arm down and the insides of the machine are very clean. Like the things just left the factory. Obviously what's happened is that no one's been able to use this because the plug hasn't been attached. It's just been sat around on some shelf somewhere for 30 odd years. And the outside of the case might look battered, but the insides are brand new. I really should have paid attention to the sticker that was on the top of it. I just thought it was a 30 odd year old sticker, but it was still relevant. Remove the shipping screw and spacer before use. And that was the problem. Anyway, once I got those out of the way, I then put the stylus in that was out of my first machine and of course it did fit because they're all the same model in the UK and now finally I can sit down and have a look at my first CED in full colour so let's just take a moment and have a look at this yeah it seems like Robert De Niro is having a bit of trouble walking there so let's have a go with Rocky instead Yeah, it's a bit like watching a blipvert, if you remember those from Max Headroom. Anyway, the stylus in the first player obviously worn out, so enter player number three, which I bought just for the stylus. Now, this machine cost me £4, again advertised as being in need of repair. Pretty much the same machine as the second one, other than the fact the second machine was a wide remote control model, and this one's the higher up the range infrared remote control. 
Now, if you're wondering how you connect one of these up to a television, it's using standard RCA plugs with a composite video signal. However, if you were to buy the mono model, these are stereo, if you've got the mono one, it just connects up using the RF, the aerial lead, so that's one to avoid. Anyway, we'll have a look here. You can see it's now playing properly. This is the player number two using the stylus out of player number three. And of course, with the help of all the knowledge that I gained from taking player number one apart. So finally, 33 years after the format died a death in the UK, I can finally watch my first CED movie. And you'll notice the machine itself looks pretty good here as well. That's because I've swapped the lid off the third one onto the second because it was much less scratched. So it's pretty much good on the outside and the inside now, which is something I can't really say about those discs that I got included with the first machine I bought. They all look like they've been stored in a pond. So to give the machine the best possible chance at performing properly, I've gone and got myself a brand new disc on eBay that was still in its cellophane. So let's sit down and have a look at our first CED movie. Now we'll just have a look at the controls on the machine for a second and then I'll go back to some more video. So you can see we've got an LED for side one and side two, a stereo light. If it was bilingual, two mono tracks, we could switch between them there. We could also scan, which is jump forward and back or do fast forward like we're doing now. Uh, fast forward will show the video whilst you're pressing it, whereas scan will jump a few minutes at a time and the screen will go blank. It'll also go blank if you press the pause button because the stylus lifts off the uh, disc itself and just waits there until you press play again when it'll go back down again. Useful if you need to take a bit of a break in the movie because if you were to press the stop button, the stylus just returns right back to the beginning of the disc, which is of course what it also does when it reaches the end of a side. And when you reach the end of a side, you have to get up and you get your caddy out, put it back inside the machine to grab the disc, flip it over, and then put side B. And you can imagine that they would maybe have worked out a way to do uh, a double-sided player if these things had lasted a little bit longer than they did. Now I want to play you some video that I've captured directly from the device using a capture card. It's come from this disc here, which I can't imagine anyone's too fussed about the copyright on. I'm pretty sure Disney would jump on me if I showed you the Muppets. So let's just have a quick look at this one. The dark brown stone she was holding was a giant tooth. And there were many more crashed together in the sandstone nearby. She rushed to tell her husband of her amazing find. There could be teeth. Where did you find them? Down the line, and together, they traced the source of the mysterious giant teeth back to a local sandstone quarry. Now you'll have noticed a few skips and jumps in the video there. Now that's something that occurs more on some discs than others. However, even on the brand new Muppet disc that I got that was in cellophane, it jumped perhaps three or four frames, maybe four or five times during the course of watching the whole film, which wasn't bad and didn't really affect it too much. But on some discs, it renders them pretty much unwatchable. Let's just have a look at Poltergeist for a minute. So I tried watching a few of those discs that I got with that original bundle and pretty much all of them did the same thing. I thought I was getting along okay with the film, it was playing pretty fine and all of a sudden it would just jump forward five minutes and then it would do it again. And before you knew it you were halfway through a film and you'd only been watching it ten minutes. So it's not really viable for me to try watching any of these films on the CED format. And besides which if I really did want to watch any of these movies nowadays I wouldn't want to watch them on a CED, I'd want to watch them in HD. And there's another reason as well that I wouldn't want to watch a CED and why I'd even prefer to watch a VHS in many cases. When I bought videotapes in the 90s, there was one thing that I always looked out for 
and it was widescreen releases. I never really bought tapes or rented them in the 80s, but in the 90s I bought quite a lot because they had special widescreen editions. And to me, watching a film in its proper aspect ratio is a big deal. And it's why I can still watch Laserdisc from the 1990s. The early Laserdiscs were full screen like the CEDs were, but the 1990s had deluxe widescreen editions, and those ones I can still enjoy despite the slightly soft picture. So let me just demonstrate the issue to you with this little freeze frame I've taken out of the film here. If we zoom in towards the TV, look at what we can see there. Perhaps a bit of a cross on the left, although we're not entirely sure it's a cross and a fence at the bottom, etc. Now, if we move across to the HD version, obviously a lot sharper, and I've tried to frame it as best I can to look like the previous one. However, this one has so much more in it. If we zoom back, that is what's supposed to be in that frame of film. A full cross on the screen and gravestones either side. So that pales in comparison and that's one reason I just can't watch these old releases. They're all in 4-3 aspect ratio in the UK. There's a couple of widescreen ones in the US but very few because of course most people were watching 4-3 TVs and didn't want to watch them with big bars at the top and the bottom. So I can't watch any of those discs anymore. However that's not to say I haven't had a lot of fun with CED. From getting hold of those old broken machines, figuring out how they work and then realising that you can get pretty much most of the ones that aren't operational in the UK working working for £1 and 8p worth of new belts has been a lot of fun to find out. I've even managed to get the third machine up and running just for the heck of it. But more than anything else, this experience has reminded me how much home entertainment has evolved since the early 80s. And what once was seen as high tech is now pretty much unwatchable. You can see exactly what happens if you pour plaster into a dish and then drop a chicken bone into it. So whilst it's been fun, it's time for me and the CED to part ways and it's got to give up its space underneath the television to leave a nice gap that can be filled by something slightly more capable that I'll show you in a future video. So history records the video disc as a monumental consumer electronics flop, and I suppose rightly so. I mean, after all, it did pretty much bring down the RCA Corporation and necessitate its sale to GE. But it's easy to be snarky about technology with the benefit of hindsight. Of course, now you can look back and say the idea of playing video back off a vinyl disc with a stylus was a technological dead end. But if it was a few years earlier to market, things might have been quite a bit different. It was originally intended to come out in the late 70s. If it had made it to market at that point, uh, when video tape recorders were so expensive that no one could afford one, things might have been a quite a bit different. But just go forward a few years and a few people started to get hold of uh, beta and VHS systems. A rental shop started opening up, renting out uh, films. People saw those and decided they wanted their own video recorder for their own home sell more video recorders the price suddenly starts to plummet on those i mean originally the video disc was supposed to be a cheaper alternative because the players were half the price of a video tape recorder but a few years later that price difference had pretty much been eroded and of course don't underestimate the attraction of recording and time shifting your own programs and that's something you just couldn't do with a video disc system but i suppose in a way it's a bit of an idea kind of ahead of its time you see 15 years after the demise of the video disc people were quite happy to buy their films on discs on dvds uh, to play at home on a device that wasn't a recorder because of course then they tended to have their pvr which could record the television, or maybe some people still have their old VHS systems. I know there were DVD recorders, but really not many people bought those. But of course then, fast forward another 15 years, the idea of buying films on discs, on DVDs, or even Blu-rays is pretty much going out of fashion. And people aren't that interested in physical media anymore. So it just goes to show how the consumer electronics market has its ebbs and flows. And unless you catch it just right, you could end up with a monumental flop like the video disc. But anyway, that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.